Okay, our next speaker for today is Akos Chilling on security awareness and development. Akos. Thank you. So my name is Akos Chilling. I'm from Hungary. I work at Bosch. Actually, I walk by this building every day in my childhood. I live one block from here. So I will talk about a soft topic, awareness, and in particular awareness in a large organization, which you can see from my slide is uh, Bosch, which is a huge company. Just a short introduction about myself. I'm currently a manager at Bosch, where um, I lead a team of test engineers in automotive security and communications testing. I'm also coordinating a community of security experts within this site. And uh, by the way, this was founded by my friend Mate Camilo, who will also speak later today. And um, yeah, by, by training, I'm a physicist. I, by now, I spend like 20 years in, in industry, five of which in security. So I'm quite new in the domain. I also have a family with three children, or teens by now. But okay, let's talk about Bosch. It's a large company. We have large in the sense that we have 73,000 people working in just in research and development. So we do develop a lot of products. We do have a lot of people working on these products. And um, yes, the, the kind of products are various uh, in various business sectors, most of them in automotive or uh, mobility industry from e-bikes to trucks always the components not the whole whole vehicle and you may know the power tools and home appliances but also there are some other domains but here specifically in budapest we have a research center with uh, roughly 3000 engineers working mostly on automotive development and uh, we have a very nice campus but okay here are some examples of the products that we work on and um, I want to point out one specific aspect of these products, that these are physical products. For me, this is great because I like touching what I work with. But in terms of security, this raises a number of questions that are slightly different from a web application. Of course, the system architecture comprises hardware and software elements with a whole supply chain for both. But also, if you think about a car, then the owner may have an interest in hacking this. So if, if I talk about tuning, this is quite understandable that people want to increase the performance of their car. And they are willing, some, or at least some of them, are willing to take this beyond the legal limits. And um, also, attackers have unlimited physical access, so they can just buy one of the products, one car or, or one component, and spend as much time as they want in taking this apart, analyzing it, understanding how it works, developing an attack, and then they will try to scale this to the whole fleet. And this is what we want to prevent. And also, cars are parked on the street, so anybody can have access, at least a limited access, to the, to the devices uh, that they want to attack. So this brings up some of these physical cybersecurity topics. For me, the mo most important point is that the cybersecurity of our product is not a software-only problem. We need to involve our system engineers, our hardware engineers, people working in functional safety, people working in testing. We need a dedicated security testing team, but also all the other testers need to be aware of it at least a little bit of security. And most important, our managers must be aware of the risk involved in cybersecurity. We heard quite a bit about this from the previous, but I just want to bring you one specific technical example, this German replay attack. When you press the remote control to open your car, it will send a radio signal to the car, which the car interprets. If it sees the correct code, it opens the doors. However, with suitable equipment, basically a, a cheap radio, you can catch this signal and then play it back. Hopefully, playing it back will not work, 
because this was foreseen and the secret key that is exchanged in this message is uh, based on a pseudo-random number generator and it changes every time. So it's quite difficult to, to decode this and predict the next value. On the other hand, if you can jam the reception, so while the user is pressing the button and you are capturing the signal, you are also sending another signal to the car, which makes the car unable to detect, then you can save this key and use it later. And we, this is a published attack. We reproduced it in our lab and it actually works. So yes, uh, and this is just one example of, a, of an attack where the various domains have to work together in order to ensure that the design and the product is safe and secure. Okay, of course, Bosch, at Bosch, we understand this and we, we, security is important for us. Even if we were not hacked last week, we think that it is still important for the future. And uh, of course, it's part of our quality promise. At Bosch, we are very strong about our, what we promise in terms of quality to our customers and security is a part of that. We must make sure that our products are secure. We have an incident response team. So you go to any Bosch website, you will find a link to the product security incident response team where you can report a vulnerability and you can find the previous vulnerability reports that we published. You will not find all the products, of course, because many, in, in many cases we are a supplier for a, a for an integrator or another company and the product is on the brand name of another company so we, we are not allowed to publish vulnerabilities on that but anyway we have a, a well-defined security engineering process of course automotive industry works based on processes but also this applies to all Bosch, Bosch as a whole all products it covers the full product life cycle it uses a risk-based approach. So we do a certain risk analysis and we evaluate the risk of each of the vulnerabilities or, or each of the potential vulnerability threats. Uh, we do have defined customers and supplier interfaces, which are based on a dialogue. So it's not that a fixed framework, but we talk to our customers and our suppliers about security. And um, of course, development has to be secure and actually testing is also part of that process security testing so i think that in terms of of our processes we are well set we are quite confident that our pro products are reasonably secure at least as the state of the art hopefully better i want to introduce one topic from my testing background this is shift left in a testing environment shift left is a very simple concept that the later you find a bug the more expensive it is to fix it. So that's why you need to test early instead of having a waterfall approach where you develop everything and then you start testing it at the end. We use a V model approach where from the beginning, from the first day we start the specification, we enter into the review of those specifications and we start designing the test so that the testing process can be preloaded into the project and, and we can start testing as soon as possible. Also, very, there is a very strong emphasis on unit testing and, and so on to, to start to identify any bugs and vulnerabilities as soon as possible so that we can fix them. This includes a lot of reviewers, of course. Of course. Now, how, how we apply this to security? Of course, the product gets real attacks once it's on the market. In terms of a car, once the car is sold and running on the street, that's when people will start attacking it, and that's when they start developing the, the attacks and vulnerability uh, attacks on it. So responding to attacks is actually quite late in this context, because imagine if there is a an, uh, an, uh, successful attack on a vehicle, a, a vulnerability is discovered, then um, basically you have to recall the vehicle and fix the bug. It's not so easy that you just deploy a patch. So. Therefore, security testing is a must, of course. You do a vulnerability, you do a penetration test before it goes on in production. This is part of our processes and it's essential, but it's still quite late. So it's better if you can review already your design and, and your concepts, you, you review 
based on in terms of security where whether your design is secure and so on but of course designing for security is even better so that's what we do we design for security but can we do even better that and that's where awareness comes in and that's what we are trying to do to make our engineers and developers aware of security issues before they even start developing so that um, already from the first idea and the first concept that they write down everything they do with security in mind and that's what we did we did a, a CTF game in-house. Um, we called it Hack Like a Bosch. I wanted to put language, but it doesn't, didn't fit in the name correctly. So uh, we reused an, a name from an older event and we used a, a hashtag from uh, publicity. But OK, this was internal, so it was relatively easy to get this approved. And of course, we had an introduction section, one week game, and then a closing session where the idea was to to put in the link of what people found in the game with their daily life and, and, and our daily processes. So we did need some design cho choices at the beginning. Um, of course, by gamification. So we wanted a, a capture the flag game instead of a web-based trading. This was very clear from the beginning that we don't want just one more training in a long sequence of trainings. Since we want to talk about or raise awareness, of course, it is for beginners. So the idea was not to make our experts even better. The idea was to make our non-security developers, engineers, a little bit aware of security issues. Also, we had to address non-software topics. I mentioned that with physical products, there are lots of security topics which are not software and this was an important aspect, and uh, basically it um, had a strong selection for the provider of the game. So, okay, if it's not our profession to develop CTF games, so we asked Zero IT Lab, uh, an external company, to do that for us. And basically in the selection process, this was very important that we wanted a company that is um, at least willing to invest into this non-software non aspects of the game. But then, okay, they are still an IT company, so we, we asked our own um, domain experts, so our software, hardware, system engineers, to review these games and try to help with, make the games more relevant for their work. And uh, in the end, I think we, we managed to put together a, a nice game. It was fully online. Of course, we had a pandemic situation, so that was the only choice. Well, actually, we didn't want to take risks, so we, we went with that one. And of course, it's in English. Even in Hungary, we are in international international company, lots of foreigners. Even in my team, I have foreigners. So it had to be English. And that meant that scaling it from a local event to a global event was a no-brainer. So we, we, did, we offered it. Uh, worldwide within Bosch and um, yes just a typical challenge this is a classical uh, classical uh, CTF um, security challenge buffer overflow exploitation so we provided a piece of source code with a buffer and a secret function on top that uh, you had to call in order to get the flag and basically you had to construct the um, input to uh, call the secret function. I know that this is not a beginner level exercise, but we provided enough hints so that anybody could do it. Unfortunately, there were a few bugs in the system, so in the end only the experts could do it, but the idea was still great and, and uh, it was a beginner level exercise. Then I also wanted to show a more challenging uh, case when we wanted to do a really system engineer type exercise. System engineers are not supposed to write code. The, in their daily life, they don't see a line of code. They think about functions and architecture and solutions. So we provided a, a system architecture diagram and asked them to derive the security requirements for this. 
um, here we had a, an issue that we didn't have a nice way to derive a flag out of that. So basically, we, we planned with a manual review of the responses, but it was, well, it was difficult. And it's still an open question, how can we formulate nice non-software challenges in a game environment? In the end, we had players from all over the world. Um, we could not get personal identification of the players for data privacy and data security issues, which of course, when you do a security game, you have to respect data privacy very strongly. So the solution was that it was hosted internally on the corporate network with no access externally. Also, no hacker tools were allowed because this was running on the corporate network. On the corporate network, we don't want anybody st starting a port scan or anything like that. So people were only allowed to use software that is already approved for general use in the company. And still, in terms of the results, we had um, 30 challenges with 11 of them non-software category. And we had nearly 500 players in, in a number of teams. So we did reach a wide audience. Um, and uh, in the end, there were nine teams who sold everything. Of course, they started with previous knowledge. These were the security experts within the company and the software professionals who work in this environment. But we did have a lot of uh, novice users and a lot of people solved at least one challenge. And of course, also our publicity reached a lot of people, even if they did not play in the end. So it was a kind of a first of an event where we used gamification on a large scale to address a lot of people with uh, product security awareness. It was more difficult than we intended, and it was more software than we intended. So the takeaway is still that cybersecurity is an essential product quality. All developers need to be aware, and it's not only a software problem, it's much more than that. But it is fun and useful to organize internal events for your colleagues and also bridge, building bridges between different domains is very important. So definitely we are going to do it next time. And yes, thank you for your attention. I'm open to questions. Yes, please. Uh, so how can they use it again for every transaction? There is a randomly generated key. Well, that is there is one more step which I did not mention to be brief. Um, basically, if you press the button and the car doesn't open, what do you do? Pressed again. Okay, so we capture the second signal again, but the second time we already use up the first code to open it for the user and we keep the second. Uh, yeah, but my question is, that, well, so how does it, how can they use it? So, uh, uh, so the, the key is not generated both in the car and in the... It's the same random number generator, so theoretically there is a match. But what happens if you just so happens that you press your button when you are far away from the car? So the car cannot rely on exactly the next key. It has to have a buffer of a certain number of keys that it will accept. And because of that, it will accept if you use the, that key a little bit later. Okay, thank you. But, okay, so, so if you want all the details, you can read the corresponding publication. You search for this gem and replay, you will find it. Um, but this is just one example. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes, and not as much as we, uh, yes, and not as much as we wanted. So, um, yes, um, basically security became a little bit more current in the organization, um, but it's clear that the, the main audi or, or the main success was among the security community. So people who were already aware of security, they got very, very excited by this game, very much interested, they played a lot. A lot of people who were dealing with security on a process level on some aspects of security got involved in more practical aspects. So we got feedback that 
somebody who, who is an expert in security testing. It was the first time he actually tried one of these buffer overflow exploitation tactics or, or exercises. So in that sense, it was really great. And, and it also, for us locally, in, for the Hungarian security team, it was a great opportunity to be known in the wider company. In terms of what happens with the next development project starts, we have very little feedback. So we cannot see what happens when people are starting their next project, whether they actually see, think about it. So we don't have a good feedback mechanism for that. Thank you. And the follow-up question would be, can you talk about the effort required to get through this exercise? Because I guess it takes quite a lot of time from your end and your colleagues to put this together and run through that. Yes. Um, well, we did it more or less in spare and flexible time. Um, it took six months from the idea to the end of the game. Uh, we worked with a team of 10 people, roughly, but uh, besides our day job. So it was not our main job for anybody to do this. It was my priority project, but I have relatively large flexibility in how I spend my time, so it was not an extra time for me. And uh, also for the others, it was a relatively low effort. We had to pay uh, for, for the game developers, but that was also quite reasonable within corporate standards. So actually, it was a relatively low effort. Okay. If no more questions, then thank you very much.